Welcome to the Making Sense Podcast. This is Sam Harris, and I am once again with my friend Paul Bloom. Paul, thank you for joining me. Hey, Sam. Good to talk to you. We've been making a, a habit of this. This is fun. This is a lot of fun, and and I just want to. So I'm, I'm Paul Bloom. Everybody knows who you are, but I'm Paul Bloom, professor of psychology at Yale University, and I want to sort of start by continuing a conversation we were having, you know, just just now, and we've been having over the last little while. Well, I'm going to try to get you to say something nice about Trump, and I figured out the way to do it. Put it huh. this way: are, are you ready for it? Yeah, yeah well, I'm bracing myself because this, yeah, brace <laughs> this, this is a heavy lift emotionally and ethically, spiritually. Well, even. I'm not. I, I'll reassure you. I'm not going to ask you to say anything like he's a decent person or he has any positive moral qualities. It, it's a different line. So here's okay. how it goes: Imagine a competition that starts off with a lot of people, a thousand, a hundred gradually whittles down to a dozen. And these are extremely motivated people. They're accomplished. Some of them have extremely strong records of success. And they're seeking after probably the most sought after prize in the world. Hmm. And they have a competition that lasts a year, at least many, many months. This is seeming vaguely familiar. And it is vaguely familiar. That's right. Not a hypothetical. Not a hypothetical. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they, they, they battle independently. But there's a lot of face-to-face confrontations where they're in a room and a million people are watching them. Yeah. And it's a zero-sum game. It can only be one winner. Yeah. And after a long, savage battle, this guy who actually had never competed before, who had no, no, <laughs> no reasonable qualifications for it, wins. So as you've twigged on, I'm talking about the Republican primaries, and I'm talking about Trump winning. Now... I'm less impressed that he won the election. Once you get to an election in this country, it's a coin toss. You know, the, half the people are going to vote for the Republican, half for the Democrat, and you're fighting for the smidgen of undecideds. Mm. But doesn't it say something extraordinary about him that he won? I can give you some of what you're asking for, I think. Yes, he, he clearly has an understanding of television that his opponents didn't have, even though they're all, they were all professional politicians, and some of them are just anti-charismatic. I mean, he's, he was up against Ted Cruz and Jeb Bush, people who didn't have a stage presence and couldn't be trained to have one, apparently. And you add to that his experience as a showman, really, you know, as a reality TV impresario, mm-hmm. mostly. Again, I go back to my evil Chauncey Gardner thesis, yeah. which is the responsibility for his success really isn't in him. It's more in the environment. It's in the electorate's relationship to fame and having seen someone on television so much. He was, in fact, one of the most famous people on earth, even though he was kind of a Rodney Dangerfield character in the business community. But he's one of the most recognizable people, more so than his opponents. But that's the environment. I mean, I guess I should remind people not everyone knows the reference because I'm old, but Chauncey Gardner was this character in the Jersey Kosinski novel, Being There, which became that film starring Peter Sellers. And he was a gardener who happened to be a moron, but he was overheard saying aphoristic things like, in the spring, new flowers always bloom or something like that. And this was mistaken for political wisdom and then through the course of events, he winds up being an advisor to the president. But so in that case, it's totally clear that the audience is in on the joke. They realize he's a moron, albeit a wholly well-intentioned one. And it's all of the projection and misapprehension and confusion in the environment that winds up promoting him to a position of power. And when I look at Trump, when I look at the things that he's done that have been so successful, like, you know, chanting locker up at his rallies, right? Now, was that a brilliant act of political persuasion? Was he playing 4D chess with the electorate? Or did it just happen to work given the political attitudes and moral attitudes of 40% of America? And I think it's the latter. I mean, I think he literally could have said almost anything ugly and authoritarian and sexist. He could have said, and I'm just going to now spitball from the ugliest part of my male imagination. He could have said, I wouldn't want to see her naked. I'll tell you that. You know, keep your clothes on, Hillary. Then people would be chanting, keep your clothes on, right? I think he actually did say, he was talking about her, 
I think, going to the bathroom at some point in one of the debates, and, and you know, the crowd went wild at the very thought of it. Maybe I've repressed that moment. Yeah. I don't see Lock Her Up as a brilliant political move. I don't even see it as a move. It's more of him that allows him to show up as a kind of super stimulus to 40% of America. I mean, there's something so cartoonish about him, and, it, and he has the power of a cartoon. And now you, you've got me on another anti-Trump rant here. <laughs> this is, but, so I once said he was like a golem that had been conjured by every bad thing that had ever been said about America. It's like the physical manifestation of everyone's external judgments of just what the ugly American is like. But it is something like that. I mean, if you took professional wrestling and McDonald's French fries and the NRA and infomercials about bogus products that don't work, and you just mix them all together and you stick them in the back of a tacky white limousine and you drive it around Central Park 500 times, you open the door, out would step Donald Trump. He's the confection of all of that American crap. And for whatever reason, that apotheosis of all that is wrong with us, all that is just self-regarding and obtuse, that works for 40% of America at this moment in American history. So it's a kind of perverse power. He's got the whatever, you know, that, uh, what, what was the, I don't really follow the Avengers movies, but the, um, what was that glove with all the stones that Josh Brolin was trying to get? Yeah. Thanos. Uh, yeah, Thanos yeah. with his glove. I mean, he's, he's got the <laughs> stones of fucking hypocrisy and narcissism. And, you know, he's working on the banality of evil. And eventually he will have all the power in the universe when everything goes wrong. So I have really failed in my quest <laughs> so, to get you to so, say so something that, nice is that, about it. Is that what you were hoping for? It has backfired horrendously. So here's, here's your counter-analysis as I see it. My analysis is he has some skills in that he knows what to say to enrage many people, including you and me, and to delight so many others. Face-to-face -face in a debate, he'll go, he'll be savage and cruel and comic and funny in a way that other people can't. And, and they'll yes. go places other people won't go. And these abilities, these, these dark abilities, are a large part of why he's president now. I think your analysis is more like, I can't, I can't reiterate your, your, your beautiful description, but somehow he spawned. The, somehow he was born and, mm. and, he, and he developed. And now you have this creature with this, this disgusting, degrading manner, which bizarrely is strangely appealing. And he gets no credit for it. It's just the way he is. Maybe I'll give you a little more than you have any right to expect. I can imagine, in fact, I'd be surprised if this weren't true. I can imagine that behind closed doors, I would be surprised at how he shows up. I bet he's got some level of, of emotional intelligence and charisma that, if only given now that he's ruler of the free world, because I've never met him, I've never seen him in person, I would imagine that the person I see on television and on stage is not the whole person. Something has to explain the fact that behind closed doors, he manages to keep anyone on his team for more than a day and a half. Though often not much longer than a day and a half. <laughs> Yes, that's true. But, but yeah, I, I, I think, I, I agree. I, I don't think, you know, I don't think when he's sitting by himself, you know, he's, he's reading Dickens and, and writing poetry. Wouldn't that be amazing? But that would be something. <laughs> but, but I imagine that a lot of what we see is a show. And, and it's a very, very good show. And it's, it's quite entertaining. And, and I think that, that he might, in his personal life, actually just kind of tone it down and become more of a recognizable human being. Right. But there's something else which is a, a very backhanded compliment. I think he's very good at being cruel. I think he's a very effective sadist. I feel that a lot of his vicious attacks on people, of which they number in the hundreds, if not the thousands by now, have really hurt people, have really mm -hmm. damaged people. And I think he, he has the, 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 bully, the bully's understanding of, where, of, of, of what will make their victim cry. He's definitely a bully, but again, the effectiveness of his attacks on people, the fact that it deranges their lives and you know, often causes them to have to get security or move from where they're living, I mean, it really 
they're effective in really screwing people over massively. Again, that's not a sign of how cutting his or clever his names are for people or anything else he's actually tweeting. It's just the fact that he's the leader of a, a mob. He's got a dangerous personality cult behind him. And we live in an environment where if you have anything like that kind of social presence, you can just direct your mob to dox people and otherwise screw them over online. And he does that. I mean, he does it yep. totally recklessly. You know, eventually someone's going to get killed because of one of his tweets and there'll be no recourse. He's got to know that what he does is dangerous on Twitter. I guess part of what's driving me is, is almost a version of the argument from design, where if you see something complicated, and in this case successful, you say it's unlikely to be random. So, you know, if, if we were theists, we might say, I guess God decided that Trump was this man and, and, and gave him this great fortune. But we're not theists. So I think what we should look for is some ability, something, something going on that has caused him to do these extremely low probability things. But he, I mean, he's the distillation of the American grotesque in a way that is, you know, we have not seen before. I and mean, we saw its manifestation on reality TV for yeah. more than a decade. His theme song was, I think it was Money, 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 right? And it's just the crassness of American bullshit, if you played it with gold, that's Trump. And yet, through amazing happenstance, he managed to move it all the way into the Oval Office. And now it's there. And the juxtaposition between who he is, really, and the moral and political seriousness of trying to steer human history yeah. at this moment is an insane juxtaposition. And, you know, half of the country wants to see every institution destabilized anyway. Yep. I mean, the other thing is the lack of regard, the lack of respect, the lack of trust in institutions now is an all-time low. And that is, I mean, he is the personification of that change of attitude. I mean, he's ushered it in to some degree. It also was the explanation for the fact that he was able to take the stage in the first place, I would say. Yeah, I'll just say, I, 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 I agree with a lot of that. I'll just say one thing, which is that I'm sure you've had friends, I have friends too, who said they predicted this. And mm. some of them did predict it. I sure as hell didn't. And, and no. I, I bet you didn't. So whatever happened, it wasn't obvious it was going to happen. Look, so question. You and I were talking before about the Democratic debate. And right. so can I get you to say something nice about Sanders? What do you think of Sanders? <laughs> I should remind people our last podcast was recorded just before the Democratic debate in Las Vegas, where Bloomberg made his first appearance. And I believe I was appropriately cautious in my, um, my expectations for Bloomberg. We, we were both cautious. Neither yeah. one of us said, Bloomberg's going to really <laughs> rip it up up there and do very well. No. So I was certainly worried about that. I'm, I don't know that I thought his performance was as bad as it has been said since. It was definitely bad, but you know, it, yeah. it's being viewed as just catastrophic. It, it, could, it could have been worse. Yeah, no doubt. Imagine yeah. ways in which it could have been. But, he, but he, he did very, very poorly. He could have burst into he tears. Have, he could have yeah. cried. He could yes. have, you know, shat himself. There's, yeah. there's a whole list of options which could have been worse. Yeah. But, but once you get beyond the sort of... He did very poorly. And, and he yeah. did poorly in a way that I think, unfortunately, matched up with the negative view many people have of him. The truth is that there just may not be good answers to some of those challenges, right? So that could explain it. But he did seem kind of blindsided by much of what Warren was giving him. You would imagine he would have practiced and practiced and practiced and worked with people and do the thing that these politicians do, which is come up with a, a joke or a way to distract it or a way to honestly apologize. And he seemed as if he, these challenges about the sexual harassment issues, about stop and frisk, he was hearing them for the first time. Right, right. There was a New Yorker article that gave some color to what those NDAs probably conceal. It sounds like he's going to release a few of them, but I don't know whether there's more, but it just sounds like he clearly is from the Mad Men era of, yeah. you know, sexual impropriety. And so the kinds of things he said, again, there's no allegation for anything he's done in, no. in the Me Too sense, which is certainly good and compares favorably with the president who's trailing, I think, 19 allegations of sexual assault. This is utterly asymmetric warfare here. The fact that we have to concern ourselves with Bloomberg's bad jokes 
where the president has managed to get off scot-free. I mean, we're now recording this on the day that Harvey Weinstein was just found guilty of some degree of rape, and it wasn't the highest charge on which he was indicted, but he's still facing, it seems, a lot of jail time for what yeah. happened today. And Trump is a character like Weinstein, if these allegations about him are true, or at least damn close. We're not talking about bad jokes. So it's crazy that the Democrats are... The debate was, as many of us tweeted, like a circular firing squad. I mean, basically, everyone was quickly rendering everyone else unelectable. And that's what I'm worried about on our side, that we could just get to the general election with whoever the candidate is. This is somebody who has to function by ethics and political norms that don't translate at all across the aisle. And yet there's no way of transcending this basic asymmetry. So, so let's take this one step up. Isn't this the stupidest way to choose a leader yeah. and have a, a debate? I mean, you know, it, it's, it's what people do. People like seeing fighting. But debates demonstrate the ability to memorize good lines, to be good at interrupting, to be very fast on your feet, you know, to be, to be savage in a certain way. I, I've heard people say we really want a good debater to come out from this, this sequence of democratic debates so they could be a good debater against Trump. And it, it seems ridiculous. What a terrible way to choose a leader. Yeah. You know, I, 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 t I, tend, I tend to have a libertarian streak. But I got to say, if, if, if I was in charge, I would, I would, you know, ban debates at the political stage. No more debates. People should, be, should speak, should get interviewed. They should be discuss, discuss their policies and everything. But this mano a mano, you know, demonstration of your, of your basically combat ability is so grossly unrelated to what you'd want in a yeah. president. No, I, I agree. You know, we, yeah. we, we, we don't do that for anything else we value. If you're looking for a swim coach. You don't have them debate other swim coaches. You don't have university presidents debated out. Only for this. The problem with debates, which I've long worried about, is that the way to win a debate is to get a big laugh at your opponent's expense. If you can do that, you have won no matter what else happens in the debate. It does reward any kind of comic timing or you know, a semblance of comic timing, given the lackluster performances of the kinds of people who tend to find themselves on those stages. But yeah, if you can get off a good line, you win. Yep. So it, it has no relationship to your qualifications for the office. I think there's one thing. So you asked me about Sanders, and I think there's something I, I should yeah. clarify because I noticed some comments in response to the last podcast. So I believe I said last time around that I thought Sanders is unelectable, which I noticed provoked some howls of displeasure. And I think I also wondered whether or not it might be preferable to have a billionaire self-fund his campaign, you know, i.e. Bloomberg, and then be beholden to no one. And that that might be better than the, the normal situation where politicians perpetually have their hands out and get entangled with special interests. And I remember you countered that in the case of Bernie, we're talking about small donations, not special interests. And then I yeah. further said that I wondered whether this just made him beholden to the leftist mob. And so some people interpreted this as my expressing a preference for aristocracy or oligarchy over democracy. So I, I think I should clarify that. My paramount concern here is that we get Trump out of office for reasons that I <laughs> have not been shy about stating. And so my concern with Bernie being captured by his audience is that he may be unable, I, mean, I think he's frankly unable, to tack to the middle in a credible way in the general election. And therefore, I think he's just bound to lose to Trump. I mean, I know we have polls that show him beating Trump in some key states, but in the last few days, this has changed a little bit. But you know, up until a few days ago, he has not experienced the extremely uncharitable vetting that he's going to get hour by hour in the general election. And so, I mean, we're now seeing videos of him, his you know, recent trip to the Soviet Union, where you know they, their cultural institutions and their subways seem so much better than our own. You know, this is at the height of the Cold War. We're seeing articles where you know he's blaming us for the hostage crisis in Iran and blaming Carter as a warmonger. You can find him looking completely out to lunch with respect to our foreign enemies. And he also can't say how he's going to pay for anything. And as the price tag for his promises goes up into the 
tens of trillions of dollars. I mean, literally, he, the 60 Minutes interview last night suggested that he was you know, about to cut a check for a minimum of $30 trillion over the next 10 years, but it was probably more like $50 trillion and could give absolutely no account, no credible account of how he could pay for this. And this is just the beginning. This is like the first 48 hours of him looking like he's going to be the candidate. I'm just worried that he's actually unelectable. That's saying nothing about my attitude toward democracy or even, you know, Sanders himself. It's just, I'm just worried that promoting him is guaranteeing four more years of Trump. I think some of that might, might be true. I mean, one thing to realize is if we choose any other name, Warren, Biden, Mayor Pete, we could play the same game, right? We could, you could easily list all sorts of problems this person has. Not to the same degree. Electric. No, I, I don't, I don't wow. see it. Well, Bloomberg, I think, functions by a different physics because he, whatever his flaws are, Trump's much worse on exactly those points. And then you just have to sort of pick your billionaire. Yeah, but a lot of Democrats might refuse to play the right. game, pick your billionaire yeah. and just stay yeah. home. Yeah, that's the real liability with Bloomberg. With Mayor Pete or um, Klobuchar, I think you, you- Oh, God, I don't, don't get me- I mean- I don't know if you know this, but Mayor Pete is gay. I don't know if you've been following the news. Oh, well, he's gay. And let he's me rethink married. this. And, my and, whole political and calculus. I actually, and I actually think that that is going to be a pretty serious liability, more, more than Sanders' Judaism, which I think will actually cut into him a bit. Yeah, I think that Judaism is a non issue or close to it. I think we touched that last time. I think it's, yeah, that wouldn't be a fatal issue. And I, and I, I don't know about the homophobia variable, but. The branding issue, I mean, just the word socialism, whatever he may mean by it, I think it's fatal. It's literally like running as a pedophile, where you have to then say, no, 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 it's not pedophile as yeah. you know. You say, I know you've seen pedophiles in the movies, but the moment you're having to explain this word, you're losing. Maybe millennials and uh, Gen Z are kind of out of touch with actually awful associations with the concept of socialism, but... They, they are. When they think socialism, they think Denmark. And, 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 Bern, and Bernie's honest. He says, when I say socialism, I mean Denmark. And, you know, Denmark, there, there are arguments as to whether this could extend to the American model, but, but that's what he's talking about. But the truth is, when you look at his history, it's not so clear. If you go back far enough, he's looking pretty red, right? I, I think that's fair enough, but you got to... So one of the things you mentioned was this comment on the Iran crisis with the hostage and everything. And you got it exactly right. But what is this, 40 years ago? Right. It, it's a long time. But he would need some credible account for how he's changed and take him on the issue of Israel, right? It's like he has the sort of self-hating, masochistic, moral confusion around the politics there. He's got genuine anti-Semites and theocrats in his inner circle. I mean, like, someone like Linda Sarsour, right, who are advising him on these issues and literally functioning as his surrogates in certain cases. He celebrates these people on social media. I mean, Linda Sarsour, I mean, this is like having, you know, Farrakhan as one of your advisors. I mean, it's, it's just completely clueless about the, the moral and political asymmetries here. So, so you're, making, you're making a moral case. Let me shift it to political case. Do you think right. this is going to hurt him? It, well, it certainly should hurt him. And I think it would hurt him. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think in the general election, I mean, people will be completely freaked out by it. the idea that someone like Linda Sarsour could have conceivably wind up in somebody's cabinet. This is every bit as bad as anything Trump is capable of, right? It's just, it's nuts. Let me offer a different perspective on something you said. You said, you know, it doesn't seem like he's going to be able to adequately move towards the center. And I think you're right. But I think the advantage of Sanders to say Mayor Pete doesn't have and Biden, well, Biden might have, but the advantage of Sanders is he might actually take away Trump voters. He may take away people who voted for Trump because they feel that they, they hate the system, they feel screwed, they, mm. they feel capitalism has, has left them, you know, le they've been left out of, of everything good about America. And I think, I think Sanders could, could take Trump voters away in a way that a lot of other people on the stage would not be able to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't, I don't really, I mean, I guess, I guess it's conceivable, but then those are some pretty confused voters, and I don't know how many of them there could conceivably be. I mean, I think Warren, I mean, just the amount of daylight there is between Warren and Sanders around the 
just the word socialism and the fact that she can just say she's a capitalist and, you know, she, she's not tempted to brand herself as a socialist, even though her economic policies are in many cases indistinguishable from his. I think that's a crucial difference. And, I, you know, she's not going to get it. But, you know, something I, I, I agree with it. I, I, with you. I'm not I, I can't explain what happened. I don't think anybody can. But I always thought Warren in some way strictly dominated Sanders. Like everything yeah. Sanders did, she did better. She, she had, yeah. the, you know, a lot of his good ideas, but she didn't brand herself as a socialist. She's incredibly wonky and smart. I mean, you may disagree with her, but she's, but she's, she's very in the weeds. She's very personable face to face. And then for some reason, some combination of sexism or bad luck or, or I don't know. Well, she did one stupid thing, which I don't think Sanders has done. I mean, she got pulled into the wokeness to a degree that Sanders has. I mean, Sanders is just still just hitting the point of class warfare yeah. relentlessly, and which, you know, Warren hits as well. But Warren got pulled into the intersectional Michigas. I mean, she literally tweeted at one point, I think the tweet was like, black, cis, and trans women are the backbone of our democracy. I believe that's verbatim, right? So there's some charitable gloss you can put on that, but the fact that that gets summarized in everyone's brain as black trans women are the backbone of our democracy, all 17 of them, there's just no reason for her to do that, right? She's pandering to a constituency so small, it's so short-sighted, and it seems calculated to alienate half of America. But, but that's not, I, I, I remember the tweet you're talking about, but that's not what happened to her. I mean... Well, well no, but I do think that's a fatal flaw in her campaign. I don't know. I don't actually know what happened to her in terms of what caused her to lose her momentum this time in this last round. If she were ahead right now and we were talking about her as the front runner, yeah. I'd be worried that she's also unelectable for reasons that are slightly different than Sanders, but you know, just as concerning. So who is electable? I think if Bloomberg could complete a string of sane and seemingly honest sentences in defense of his record, I think... You, you think all those Elizabeth Warren voters would, and Bernie Sanders voters would move to Bloomberg? Everyone who doesn't want Trump will eventually have to move to whoever is in the general election for the Democrats. And I just think once there's a single candidate, you know, any of them stands a chance of solidifying everyone's understandable concern about Trump. I think if you can't energize half of America around just that single variable, just getting this guy out of office, then it's hopeless. But I think things change once there's just one of them. The moderates are split between Biden and Klobuchar and, yeah. and Buttigieg and Bloomberg. And if it could magically be Klobuchar, I think, yeah. you know, that she stands a chance. It's just like everyone would just she reset. Does stand, she does stand a chance. You know yeah. the person I miss? I miss Cory Booker. I, I've 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 never met him. I've heard great things about him, and he seems like yeah. a gracious, intelligent, broad-minded person. He's uh, yeah. he, he seems you know genuinely likable in a way I don't find any of these people. And and also what he says makes sense, and he seems rational and pragmatic and all good things. Yeah, and I could never figure out why he didn't translate better on stage or on tele. I mean, yeah. so much of this is just the way people speak. And, and now we're back to the debates and, and how crappy they are. Yeah, it's a performance. But I, I really do think it's got to be possible to backfoot Trump in a debate. It's not yeah. too much to hope that in the general election, he could be consequentially embarrassed. The, I think the best person to do that, again, it's just awful that Bloomberg doesn't have more natural gifts in this regard. Because if he had a great stage presence, he has the perfect biography to mm -hmm. go after Trump from. Yeah, and, and, and I've been kind of ragging on him the last episode and this one too, but, you know, one thing about Bloomberg is he actually does a lot of good. He gives a lot of mm -hmm. money to charity. He gives, you know, over, I think, a billion dollars to Johns Hopkins, money for regarding uh, working on climate change and gun control and helping other Democrats. He's, he's yeah. you know, a mass, unlike Trump, uh, he's a massively generous person. No, I know. I mean, that, that's why the juxtaposition is so um, invidious. But Sam, speak, speaking of juxtapositions, do parents matter? 
We, we, oh yeah, so we we, we, we got a we question to do, about this. Yeah, we, we agree. We agree to do sudden transitions. So this is yes. this is by the way okay. from Proxima Ratio, and that's the name of on a, Twitter. Yes, name of one yeah. of Sam's thirty million Twitter followers, and and he raised the question, and there's been a bit of discussion online about the idea of whether or not parenting matters. Yeah. So and this could have been seeded by our friend Steve Pinker yeah. circulating a Boston Globe article about a meta-analysis of all of the studies that have interrogated this question, whether parental influence really determines anything in the space of how kids grow into adulthood. This thesis was brought to the world's attention, I think, mostly by Judith Rich Harris. Did you know her? I, I, uh, she, she, she's passed away, uh, yeah. unfortunately. I okay. actually, um, I edit a, a journal, Behavioral Brain Sciences, where we we publish controversial and theoretically interesting things, and then dozens and dozens of people write commentaries on it. And I, I contacted her after her book and asked whether she would contribute to our journal, which we usually don't make invitations, but this was an exception. And she was very nice, but she said her health would not, would not allow it. Yeah, so her thesis was that for virtually everything we care about, the human mind, the human personality, the human ability— is basically 50% genetic, more or less, and then 50% environment. But environment, crucially from the point of view of mom and dad, doesn't seem to be anything they're doing. It seems to be the influence of peer group and other... If you'd like to continue listening to this podcast, you'll need to subscribe at samharris.org. You'll get access to all full-length episodes of the Making Sense podcast and to other subscriber-only content, including bonus episodes and AMAs and the conversations I've been having on the Waking Up app. The Making Sense podcast is ad-free and relies entirely on listener support. And you can subscribe now at samharris.org.